sense. So I'll start off with a case scenario. A 58-year-old male patient presents with a lethargy, exertional shortness of breath for one month duration. Uh, her symptoms have been gradually getting worse. Uh, and now he's developing shortness of breath even with mild exertion. He's been on painkillers for a while with diclofenac sodium, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for the last five months for multiple joint pains. So with this history, at this point, what are the possibilities you would like to think for his current presentation? So when you say exertional shortness of breath, uh, uh, there are a few things you need to consider and lethargy, exertional shortness of breath. So one of the possibilities is this a problem of the heart where you have heart failure and getting exertional shortness of breath. Is this a problem of the lungs where you have lung diseases, which would cause this symptom at particular points. Is this a metabolic problem where if you have metabolic acidosis as a compensatory mechanism, these people will be hyperventilating and you get this feeling of shortness of breath. Is this a hematological problem where if you have anemia, these people will get lethargy, exertional shortness of breath. So these are the possibilities you need to consider in these patients and they present with these symptoms. And the next you move on to examination and in this patient, this is what we have seen. So what is this clinical finding? So this is Talo. And you can see this is a normal person's hand and the affected person. And you can see that this hand is much paler compared to a normal hand, which is much red and, 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 and uh, reddish. And when you look at the conjunctiva, you can see that it's white, whereas in a normal person, this will be more red. So this is how you identify pallor with your clinical examination. So when you have this, the next thing is, what may be the cause of his presentation? What specific questions uh, do you want to uh, ask him? Uh, what are the investigations you want to do for this patient. So these are the next set of questions you have to answer. So before that, we need to know what do we mean by anemia? So the clinical sign of anemia is palo. And when do we call a person to have anemia? So there are different hemoglobin levels and depending on the age, your uh, hemoglobin cutoffs vary a little bit. So in children, you can see that it's somewhere between 11 to 12. If it is less than that, you would consider them having palo. Whereas in adult patients, in non-pregnant, it can be less than 12. In pregnant patients, because of hemodilution, it can be less than 11. And in adult patients, it will be less than 13. Once we diagnose anemia, the next thing is to stage the severity of this anemia. So if it's somewhere between 10 to 12, we we'll consider it as mild anemia. 8 to 11, moderate, and less than 8, we would consider it as severe anemia. Why is anemia important? So anemia is important because it affects almost all the body systems of a person. You can see that it can affect growth and development of children. And as shown in this picture, it can affect any body system where it can affect the respiratory system where patients will feel short of breath. It can affect the heart where you get heart failure, cardiomegaly, ischemic changes of the heart. It can affect your neurological system where our brain to the or hypoxia to the brain could cause seizures and problems. And all molecular level work at a cellular level will get affected if you are not having adequate hemoglobin because hemoglobin acts as the transport for oxygen to all the molecular level work to be done in a person's body. And this results in generalized musculoskeletal weakness and fatigue. So what happens when a person is having low hemoglobin? So the body tries to compensate. So normally the stimulation for this is the oxygenation levels. So normally you have it at a good balance, but when you are anemic, your, your oxygen levels go down and there's an imbalance which tips this. You have reduced tissue perfusion to, with uh, oxygenation and this stimulates the kidney to produce an erythropoietin called, a hormone called erythropoietin. 
And erythropoietin will stimulate your bone marrow to produce more and more red cells, which we call erythropoiesis, which increases the number of red cells in the body and brings back the normal balance of oxygenation at a peripheral tissue level. So how does this manifest in people when they are anemic? What are the symptoms and signs of this? So a few we have discussed already. They'll feel lethargic, fatigued. They sometimes will feel faintish. They, with slightest exertion, they will feel short of breath. And when you examine a person, they'll have fallow, like we showed in the picture. They'll be tachycardic because your heart, the heart rate starts increasing to improve the cardiac output so that there would be more better perfusion to the peripheral tissues. And with that, if you oscillate, sometimes you can hear what we call flow murmurs due to high turbulence because of the rapid contractility heart rates of the high, high flow, uh, flow uh, murmurs in the heart. The specific symptoms and signs will vary according to the underlying cause that is giving rise to anemia of a person. Right, so once we uh, uh, diagnose anemia, how do we classify this? Uh, we can classify this as uh, according to a pathological classification and a morphological classification. So patho pathologically uh, uh, or etiologically, one would say you can divide it into according to the cause uh, of this, where it could result in blood due to blood loss, inadequate production of normal cells, or it could be excessive destruction. So this is depending on the reason or the cause of the anemia. The other way you can classify anemia is according to the appearance of the red cell. Where it could be normocytic, which means the normal size red cells. It could be microcytic or small red cells or macrocytic, where the red cells are bigger. So if you go by the etiological classification, so blood loss, which could be an acute or chronic thing, and then there could be reduced production, where it could be due to many reasons, which we will go into detail later, like iron deficiency. And then it could be due to increased destruction, which we call hemolytic anemias. Again, we will go into detail later in our discussion. When we talk about size of the, kid, uh, the red cells, you divide it into microcytes, macrocytes, and normocytes. So this is in relation to your white cells, where if the red cell volume is less than 80, you call it microcytes. If it's more, less, more than 96 to 100, we call it macrocytes. And then in between, we call it normocytes. And depending on that, you have different causes. For example, low MCV or microcytes are given rise to due to iron deficiency, thalassemia, anemia of chronic disease, and citroblastic anemia. And if they are large cells, we divide it into megaloblastic and normoblastic, depending on the production, uh, the, the more immature forms of that, which I will go into detail later. And then you have normal cellular, normal volume of red cells causing uh, due to these reasons. Right, so if a person presents with anemia features, how do you want to investigate them? And the two most important initial investigations are your full blood count, where you confirm anemia, and then you do a blood picture look to look at the morphology of these red cells. So when you look at the mic uh, under the uh, microscope on, for your blood picture, if it is less than 80, you call them microcytes. If they are between 80 to 100, you call them macronormocytes. And if it is more than 100, you call them macrocytes. Now, this is what you would see when you look under a microscope of a, a peripheral blood film. So normally this is your red cells. You can see nicely rounded with the mid halo, pale halo. And this is the normal size of a red cell. And compared to that, you can see this blood picture where you'd see red cells, but much smaller. And if you look at them, these are much larger. So what do we have in picture B and picture C? We have microcytic anemia. And then in picture C, we have macrocytic anemia, depending on the appearance of the red cells. Right, so microcytic anemia. These are red cells which are smaller and you generally compare it to the nucleus of the normal lymphocytes. 
less than 80. And the commonest causes we talk about that gives rise to microcytic anemia are your iron deficiency anemia, thalassemias, sideroblastic anemia, and lead poisoning. So your iron deficiency anemia, you know that one of the, well, there are many ways you can get iron deficiency anemia. The commonest being it could be dietary deficiencies and due to blood loss. For example, the commonest site of blood loss is your gastrointestinal tract. If you have any ulcers or bleeders there. Clinically, they will always have features of anemia, but specifically to iron, they can get coilonychia. So that is what is shown in this picture where you get spoon, spade-shaped fingernails. You can have glossitis and angular somatitis, excessive hair loss, brittle hair, and you have this very peculiar symptom called pica, where you feel like eating uh, bricks and uh, you know sand and stones like this. That is called pica, which you get in severe iron deficiency. When we move on to macrocytic anemia, like I mentioned, these are larger red cells with an MCV of more than 95 to 100. And microcytic anemias, again, are divided into two groups called megaloblastic anemia and non-megaloblastic anemia. And this is dependent on the appearance of these blood cells immediately when they are formed within the bone marrow. So if you do a blood bone marrow biopsy in these patients, if the, uh, so you, I'm sure you would have been taught in your anatomy histology days that when a red cell develops, there are different stages in the development of red cells. Like very, very immature forms, they be, then they become megaloblasts, they go into the uh, blood, uh, blood circulation, becomes reticulocytes, they are reticular, and then the red cells. So if you get these very immature forms in very large numbers, then you call that megaloblastic anemia. And the commonest reasons for this is conditions like B12 deficiency and folate deficiency because these two factors are needed for the maturation of red cells. If you say non-megaloblastic anemia, here the red cells have already formed, matured to a, up to a certain stage. So there won't be any significant megaloblast there. So you call it non-megaloblastic microcytic anemia. Alcohol, uh, liver disease, hypothyroidism are some of the common causes. And this is the appearance. In megaloblastic anemias, there's a peripheral film, you can see the red cells, which are big. But how you identify, or uh, you know, what would also give a clue is the appearance of your neutrophils. It's like I said, megaloblasts are more immature red cells, and along with that, you would get the other immature white cells also coming into the uh, uh, blood, flow, blood film, which are called hypersegmented neutral, which is a very uh, important feature to identify megaloblastic anemia. Uh, whereas in non-megaloblastic anemia, the maturation process is uh, uh, normal and uh, 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 this is the appearance of them. So vitamin B12 deficiency, like I said, normally this is commonly seen with vegetarians as well as you have this intrinsic factor, which is more important for absorption of vitamin B12 in your stomach. And in individuals who are deficient in this factor, you can get B12 deficiency. And in other malabsorptive syndromes, there are B12 deficiency. B12 is not absorbed properly, you can get this. So clinically, again, here, apart from anemic symptoms, you characteristically get glossitis, which is this shiny, appearance of the uh, tongue and you can see that it's smooth like not like your normal tongue where you have corrugations, rugae there. Here it's more flat and white and uh, 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 white appearance there. And then you can get neurological symptoms such as peripheral neuropathies. Hemolytic anemias. So hemolytic anemias are another separate set of anemias where, where there is destruction of the red cells and clinically what happens is these patients can present with jaundice, dark urine, and you sometimes get, get organomegaly depending on the type of hemolytic anemia like splenomegaly or hepatomegaly. So we'll go a little bit deep into this. So hemolytic anemias you can divide again into two groups called extravascular hemolysis and intravascular hemolysis. Intravascular hemolysis means your red cells are broken down within the blood, in the vascular circulation. That's why you call it intravascular. 
Whereas extravascular uh, hemolysis means that these red cells are mostly broken within organs and specifically your liver and spleen. And the two causes have different reasons and the causes underlying each type of hemolysis is different and sometimes some of the clinical manifestations are also different. So what happens with intravascular hemolysis is you have hemolysis and then the hemoglobin is feed into the circulation. And some of this hemoglobin goes directly filtered through the hip, uh, kidney and go as hemoglobin urea. So the hemoglobin is passed. If you do a urine sample, if you see hemoglobin urea, that might be an indication that this is intravascular hemolysis. And also this free hemoglobin gets bound to a molecule called haptoglobulin within the circulation. And when it binds, your haptoglobin levels go down. And, uh, and at the same time, this combination is taken up by the liver, uh, 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 the, the macrophages and in the hepatocytes. And in the hepatocytes and in, in the liver, this is broken down into unconjugated bilirubin. So that in these sort of instances, your bilirubin levels go up and this is unconjugated bilirubin. And this can go through again through the biliary system as well as this can get secreted in your urine as well. So this is what happens when you have hemolysis. So in intravascular hemolysis, like I mentioned, you have anemia, your haptoglobulin levels will go down because it binds to the free hemoglobin. You have hemoglobinemia because in your red cell, you have in your know, circulation, you have free hemoglobin. In the urine, you will see hemoglobin. And part of this hemoglobin urea gets uh, degraded into hemosiderin. So if you do a urine, you will see hemosiderin as well. Whereas in extravascular hemolysis, apart from having anemia, you will have hyperbilirubinemia. And more importantly, you'd have organomegaly like hepatomegaly, spinomegaly, because these are the places where there is a lot of red cell destruction that goes on. And at the same time, along with that, sometimes you get extra out of the bone marrow red cells getting uh, formed as well. So in your classification of hemolytic, so anemia, you have the, uh, another classification. So one way of classifying hemolytic anemia is whether at the site of hemolysis, that is whether it's intravascular or whether it's extravascular. The other way of classifying hemolytic anemia is depending on the abnormality of the red cell or the reason for the hemolysis. And that you can divide as intracorpuscular defects, which means intra, uh, any problem within the red cell causing hemolysis and extracorpuscular factors, which means anything outside the uh, red cells. So when it comes to our intracorpuscular defects, again, you can divide it into hereditary causes like in hemoglobinopathies, like your thalassemias, your uh, hereditary spherocytosis, things like that. Then you have enzymopathies where there are inherent enzyme problems within the red cells, like your G6PD deficiency, which causes. And then you have membrane cytoskeletal defects, like your uh, hereditary spherocytosis, where the red cell in itself is abnormal, large, and round. And then you have acquired causes like paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin nubia, which you do need to know at this uh, stage in your. Uh, uh, curriculum, but by the time you come to final year, you will know about these conditions. And then when you talk about extra corpuscular factors, you have familial hemolytic uremic syndromes, and then other acquired causes uh, like this, which will directly damage the red cells. So just to broadly give you an overview, because we discussed a lot of things about hemolytic anemia, and this is just to summarize that classification. Hemolytic anemia, you can divide into intravascular and extravascular, and you have different reasons for that. And then you, again, you can divide it into intrinsic or in, uh, intracorpuscular or extrinsic or extracorpuscular defects, and you have different causes for those as well. And these are the classic features you would see with hemolytic anemias. So you would have this yellowish a pinch in your uh, uh, eyes, which you call icterus. And if it's, uh, you can sometimes have hepatomegaly, liver enlargement, and splenomegaly in these patients. Right, so now we move on to the next group of anemias according to the morphology. So now initially we discussed uh, hypochromic 
uh, sorry, microcytic anemias. And now we are discussing normocytic anemias. That is, your red cell size is normal. And the commonest causes for this is chronic kidney disease, anemia, chronic disorders, where there are lots of causes that give rise to anemia, chronic disease. So as the name implies, any chronic disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, chronic kidney disease will give rise to anemia, chronic disease. And conditions like aplastic anemias, they are the bone marrow, uh, uh, bone marrow formation in itself is abnormal. So here in the management, so uh, yeah, so so just broadly, so that's the main part I wanted to discuss, just to give you a few information about the management principles governing fallow. You don't need to know a lot of detail at this point, but over the next three years in your curriculum, you will be learning each and every uh, condition that I mentioned and its management uh, and its management and how they are managed. So in any patient who comes with fallow, the first thing is that you need to diagnose anemia. Next is to identify the cause of anemia. And then depending on the urgency, you have to correct this anemia. For example, if it's severe anemia, patients, it's symptomatic. And then there's a lot of other symptoms and you need, and this is a probably a matter of urgency and these patients might need to be given blood and things like that early. Whereas if it's very mild anemia, the patient is otherwise well. If you have a bit of time to do all the investigations, identify the cause, then you can take a bit of time to manage this. And then finally, once you identify the cause, you have to treat the cause of anemia. Right, so we go back to our patient. And as you can remember, he was a 58 year old person coming with these anemic symptoms. And then uh, we, thought, we spoke about the possibilities. So, the next step in this evaluation is to go through the examination findings of this patient. And as I showed you in the pictures, this patient was pale. And then further examining, patient was afebrile. There was no icterus. There was no lymphadenopathy. However, the patient could not lie flat. And there was ankle edema indicating that there might be an element of heart failure due to this anemia. Blood pressure was also low and the heart rate was high. And this is a reflection that when you are pale, the body is now trying to compensate by increasing the cardiac output. So the lower blood pressure uh, uh, has stimulated this along with the low hemoglobin and the heart is now beating fast to compensate for this to increase the cardiac output with the tachycardia. Lungs on escartation shows bilateral basal crepitation. So whenever you hear bi-basal crepitations in a patient suspected of heart failure, this is a supportive sign. And on abdominal examination, there is some epigastric tenderness. So now what do you think is going on in this patient? So like I mentioned, this patient seems to be severely pale. He seems to have some signs of heart failure and also a significant epigastric tenderness as well. So now what are the specific questions you want to ask this patient? So you have some knowledge now about anemia. What do you want to ask this person? And what are the investigations you want to do in further evaluating this patient? So in the history, it's very important. Now we discuss different ways of analyzing anemia. So it's very important that we ask about bleeding manifestations to see whether he's actually losing blood. Important to ask about the, the very, very comprehensive dietary history and to see whether there are any different deficiencies or problems with diet, malabsorption syndromes, and any features of hemolysis. When doing investigations, this was patient, we did the basic investigations of a full blood count and was found to have a low hemoglobin of 7.2 with an MCV of 68. And then as we discussed, the next thing to do is your blood picture and you can see that the red cells are very small and then there's features of anemia also confirmed by your full blood count. So this is very compatible with the microcytic, severe microcytic anemia. And then the next thing is to identify what is causing this microcytic anemia. And if you can remember, we had a few causes listed and now we have to go through each individual cause to see whether it could be any one of those that's causing microcytic anemia. 
So one thing, one of the conditions we mentioned was iron deficiency. So in these patients, you have to order for iron studies to look whether there's evidence of iron deficiency. And interestingly, this patient also had stools which look like this. Now, what do you think this is? This is the clinical sign of melina. So melina means it looks like this when you pass stools, it will be dark, tarry, very semi uh, solid and very smelly sort of uh, stools. And this indicates that there is blood in that stool, which you can uh, medically occult blood. So now he's having features of proper possible bleeding in the gut that is causing this marina as well. And then the next step is to see where is this patient bleeding from. In order to do that, you have to go for an endoscopy. And here he had a very, if you can remember, he had a significant history for taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And if you can remember from your physiology, in the receptors and the, uh, the, the, the receptors in your, your stomach, the NSAID is actually block this and you are increasing the acidity, which gives rise to more peptic ulcers. And here we have gone ahead with an endoscope and you can see how and in the endoscope, there was a notable ulcer in the uh, 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 stomach. And this is the appearance of an endoscopic appearance of a bleeding ulcer. So what is the most likely overall diagnosis? Now we have a lot of information here. So here this patient is having a severe iron deficiency anemia due to occult bleeding from gastrointestinal tract, which is most likely due to gastric ulcer from NSAID use. Thank you. So uh, I hope you got a broad overview of anemia through this presentation and how that knowledge uh, could be applied to a clinical scenario and how that would help you to investigate and better manage a patient. So throughout the 